On this side of the tape, you will hear Dr. Howard C. Estep deliver the Bible study lecture on the book of Obadiah. We now join the Friday night Bible study in the King is Coming Auditorium as Dr. Estep is speaking from the Old Testament book, Obadiah. The book of Obadiah centers around the destruction and the sin of Edom. It also deals with the day of the Lord, the restoration of Israel, and Messiah's eternal kingdom. So due to the fact that we're involved in this study, dealing with the sins and the destruction of Edom, we want to find out a little bit about Edom, Edom and the Edomites, the nation and its people who were the descendants of Esau. Esau founded the country, so his name is equated with Edom. The country was also called Seir, S-E-I-R, or Mount Seir, which was the name of the territory in which the Edomites lived, the mountain and plateau area between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba, about 100 miles long and up to 40 miles wide. So we're talking about a mountainous desert area south of Jerusalem and also south of Amman, Jordan, and in the land of Edom is where the beautiful Red Rose city of Petra is located. Petra was one time the capital of the Edomite kingdom. So in our study of Obadiah, we are looking at Edom. Edom. Just a few little thoughts here. Referring to the kingdom of Eden was founded during the 13th century B.C., according to archaeological evidences, and then proceeds here, eight of those kings reigned over Edom before the Israelites had any such ruler, and one of these kings was on the throne at the time of Moses and refused to permit the Israelites to pass through his country. This is one of the reasons why Edom was cursed of God, according to Numbers 20, verses 40 through 21, we find that Moses wanted to pass through that area. And if you'll just bear with me a moment, we'll read that scripture in Numbers 20, beginning with verse 14. And Moses sent messengers from Kedesh unto the king of Edom, thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost part of our border. Let us pass, Moses said to the king of Edom. Let us pass, in verse 17, chapter 20 of Numbers, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword and the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. Way back in Numbers, the 20th chapter, Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, wants to go through the land of Edom. He's refused passage, and evidently this is one of the reasons that God has brought judgment upon them. Now, when did this take place, the book of Obadiah? Written in Palestine about 900 B.C. through 795. B.C. Uh, from 900 to about 800 B.C. covers a period of about a hundred years. Deals with Edom, a mountainous country founded by Esau, 
Esau and Jacob, you remember. Jacob tricked Esau into selling his birthright for a mess of pottage. And so Esau, his descendants, go into that area in the mountainous stronghold of Mount Seir, and they build up a fantastic place. Now that was about 900 to 800 B.C. About 600 years later, a wild nomadic tribe known as the Nabataeans go into the area of Edom, into the mountainous country, and they carve buildings out of the limestone or the beautiful pink sandstone cliffs of the mountains of Edom. And that's why we keep going to Petra today, because we're going down there to view the cliffs and the stone buildings and caves and holes which were dug or carved out of the mountains of Edom about 23, 2400 years ago. So when you go to Petra, you're going back into Old Testament country. We have a lesson outline. The destruction of Edom, this is verses 1 through 9. 2. Edom's unpardonable sin. Verses 10 through 14. 3. Edom in the day of the Lord. Obadiah is able to look down through the annals of time and prophetically he sees what is going to happen away yonder in the future. Edom in the day of the Lord, verses 15 through 16. And four, extermination of Edom, verses 17 through 18. And lastly, our fifth point is the restoration of Israel, verses 19 through 21. So here we're studying Obadiah. Obadiah was a prophet. He was the prophet of God, meaning the servant of God. And he is able to witness to the people of his day, to, the, to the, those of Judah and to the Israelites, all 12 tribes, telling them what would befall them. And so it's a rather interesting book, though it's only 21 verses. Our first point is the destruction of Edom, the vision of Obadiah, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. This word heathen can be translated Gentiles and not do any harm to the scriptures. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the Gentiles. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. So here we have the words of ambassadors among the heathen, a call to war against Edom. And we've read from the book of Numbers the attitude of the Edomites. The Edomites were situated up in the mountains. Their country was in a mountainous, rugged terrain area uh, where it was impossible to attack them so to speak. And yet they were on the great trade route from the Far East through the Middle East up into Europe and the camel caravans that came that way uh, were taxed and the area built up and it was a tremendous place. They had cities, villages, they had fields, vineyards, they had commerce, they had practically everything that people in other parts of the world had in those days, but yet they were situated away south of what is now the state of Israel and also south of the land of Jordan, way down in the mountains, about 100 miles due south of Jerusalem, 125 miles, something like that. So we find here that God has declared judgment and destruction upon the Edomites. She was known as the enemy of God. Look at verse 2. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. They weren't a friendly people. They were very clannish. 
They just didn't come out and out. They didn't put their cards on the table, as it were. They were trickery. They weren't fair with their fellow man. They had that cunningness about them, same as Esau had when he was willing to sell his birthright for a mess of pottage and we blame Jacob for it. I blame Esau for selling it because he was rightfully entitled to the birthright. But this was passed on to the Edomites. Verse 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. They were proud. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Fortified areas. Tremendous fortified cities. And you get evidences of that today when you go to that part of the world. You can see how over 2,000 years ago, those people were dug in, as it were, fortified, their own water supply, high up in the mountains, and it was almost difficult to attack them because they have the upper hand on you. It's always difficult to attack the enemy if you're going uphill. The Edomites recognize that. Verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, meaning away up high in the mountains, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Verse 5. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? Evidently, Edom was long known for wisdom and its wise men. When you read the book of Job, you read about Elipaz of Job. 4.1 was an example of such human wisdom. Edom produced wise men. And they were wise, intelligent, fortified. They were protected from the Arab scavengers the Bedouins who ran rampant through that area, nestled high up on the mountains. And it's quite interesting, even today, when you go into that part, you can see winding roads cut along the rock mountain ledges that take them high up and up on top of the mountains you'll find lovely accommodations that are over 2,000 years of age, uh, reminiscing of the land of Edom the land begun by Esau long centuries ago. So we see here that God is against the sins of these people. They were proud. They were lifted up because of their integrity. And so God has set forth that he's going to destroy them. In verse 8, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau, verse 9, and thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. If you'll just go forward a little bit in your Bible to Habakkuk 3.3, 3, we have a question that comes to our ministry office quite often, and people will say, where did God come from? Well, God's always been in existence. And they say, oh, no. God had a beginning because it says so in the Bible. It says in Habakkuk 3.3, 3, God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. 
And uh, this refers to God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt through Teman and Mount Paran, as we studied when we were looking at the book of Habakkuk. Now we run into the same thing here again. In verse 9, And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So Teman was one of the cities of the Edomites, just the same as Petra was one of the cities of the Edomite kingdom. So we see here, according to Obadiah, a servant of God who lived in a span of a hundred years between 900 and 800 B.C., In Palestine, he wrote this little book of 21 verses, and the whole thing was relative to the Edomites and the land of Esau. Now let's notice Edom's unpardonable sin. God never takes an advantage of anybody. The Bible says that God never tempts anybody because God cannot tempt with evil, impossible. Now here's a nation coming from the loins of Esau and they have sinned against God. They have sinned against God's people. Here comes Moses with probably two million Israelites up from Egypt. They're wandering for 40 years. He wants to pass through this mountainous area that we speak of today as Petra or the land of Edom. And he makes all kinds of promises to the king of Edom. And the king says, no, I won't let you do it. Moses said, we'll pay for it. We won't trample any of your fields. We won't uh, drink out of your wells. We won't destroy any of your foliage. We'll carefully go right through your country because this is a quick way on our way up to the promised land. The king says, no, you can't do it. Now note their unpardonable sin. You pick this up in verse 10 through verse 14. This is why God is justified in making the land of Edom a desolation. It's an absolute desolation. There's nothing there. A few Bedouin with their sheep and their goats eking out a mere animal existence. That's all that's there. They must have had sin in their lives. There was. Verses 10 through 14 give us the unpardonable sin of Edom. For thy violence against thy brother, Jacob, shame shall cover thee. For violence against thy brother, Jacob, shame shall cover thee. This is ten reasons for Edom's destruction, beginning in verse 10. And thou shalt be cut off forever. As a kingdom, the Edomites were to be destroyed forever. Evidently, God did not want that lineage of humanity to continue on the earth because they were sinners, vile sinners, proud people, unreasonable. And so God declares in verse 10 by the pen of Obadiah that he's going to cut them off forever. Verse 11. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side. This refers a way back uh, in the book of 2 Kings chapter 8, 2 Chronicles chapter 21, when the Edomites and others rebelled against King Jehoram early in the ninth century. They rebelled, the Edomites did, way back in the ninth century, and that's why this phrase here and the... uh, The men who have gone over this carefully trying to fathom it out, they picked up this little phrase here, in the day uh, that thou stoodest on the other side, they refused to cooperate back in the ninth century, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast not as one of them. In other words, when the enemy attacked Jerusalem in the ninth century, the Edomites wouldn't assist. They wouldn't help God's people. And God's people came from Jacob. Esau sold his birthright 
and it's Esau and Jacob, twins, out of the womb of Rebekah. And they're that closely associated in a family knit tie, kinship as it were, and they refuse to help their brothers in the ninth century, recorded in Second Kings and also in Second Chronicles, when uh, the people, the Jews of uh, Palestine were attacked by the enemy. The Edomites wouldn't help. Verse 12. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. You shouldn't have stood around and let your brother be taken prisoner under those circumstances. You should have helped, God is saying. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So evidently, in the ninth century... B.C., when you read 2 Kings chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles chapter 21, you'll find that the enemy came in, besieged Jerusalem, killed the Israelites by the thousands, and according to this writing of Obadiah, he is accusing the Edomites of going in and plundering the area and stealing the property of those who had been taken prisoner. And God resents that. God is a God of fairness. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't have favorites in the sense that we have favorites, although God is sovereign, and sometimes God appoints one person to a position that he doesn't appoint other people. And in that sense, you might say, God does have favorites, but yet God is no respecter of persons. When we come right down to the nitty-gritty of the thing, in the eyes of God, everybody has the same chance. God is no respecter of persons. But in this particular circumstance, God stood back, as it were, and God saw these Edomites doing all of these unbrotherly, unneighborly acts and it riled God up in his heart. And there's a verse of scripture that I like. It's, uh, I think it's in Galatians. I'm not sure. But it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And now that goes for a nation. That goes for a city. That goes for a community, a village. That goes for a church. That goes for a band of believers. Whatsoever a person sows, that will they also reap. And the Edomites reaped all kinds of sins against their brothers in the flesh and God is going to bring distress upon them and that's why he says in the, in the latter part of verse 10 and thou shalt be cut off forever notice here in the uh, latter part of verse well the latter part of verse 13 the middle of it yea thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Evidently, they squealed on those who were escaping. Those who, in Judah, who were fleeing for their life when the enemy came in, the Edomites were there and they, uh, they, they revealed what was happening and they took sides with the enemy and you know enough about war to realize that in war when someone does that they just shoot them down like dogs nobody plays around with those kind of uh, people 
who will squeal on their brothers to cut off those of his that did escape, neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his, of his that did remain in the day of distress. So here in verses 10 through 14, we have 10 reasons for Edom's destruction. I'll give them to you in one, two, three order. One, violence against Jacob his brother. Two, was an enemy of Judah at the time of their destruction. Three, gave assent to the judgment on Judah. When the enemy pronounced judgment upon Judah, the Edomites agreed. Verse uh, number four, rejoiced at Judah's downfall. Five, spoke proudly in the day of distress of Judah. Six, entered fallen Jerusalem as an enemy to take a spoil. Seven, looked on the affliction of Judah in the day of calamity. Eight, laid hands on the substance of Judah when they were defeated. Nine, stood at the crossways to kill those of Judah who would escape. Ten, and lastly, delivered up captives of Judah to be destroyed. I'd say they were traitors. If we were involved in war and we had brothers in the flesh that did what the Edomites did to Judah, I would say shoot them. They were traitors and God doesn't like that. If there's anything that God doesn't like, it's somebody that's two-faced. God likes people to be out and out what they are. Straightforward. Honest, forthright. And so God took exception to the Edomites. And they literally disappeared from the sea. That's why when you read in history, about 312 B.C., the Nabataeans, a wild nomadic tribe, Bedouins, which just wandered around the land with their herds and their black skin goat tents, and their families, they just wandered around the land, eking out a living. They came into this high, fortified, mountainous country of Edom and took over. And the Edomites were there for 250 years. And when you walk down the main drag of the city of Petra today, you can see the handiwork of the Nabataeans. And they transformed that area into a beautiful, magnificent city at one time population upwards of 200,000. God gave the land which belonged to the Edomites originally. Because of their sin, he gave it to somebody else. That's how the Israelites got the promised land. The Canaanites were violent sinners. And God objected to the sinning of the Canaanites and God allowed the Israelites to go in tribe by tribe and they defeated all of the Canaanites and took over that beautiful land that was so bountifully flourishing in productivity that the Bible speaks about the two spies who came back after spying out the land and they had a bunch of grapes on a pole over their shoulders and the bottom of the bunch of grapes was dragging along in the dust. God gave the Jews, the Israelites, that beautiful land belonging to the Canaanites and so he gave the land of Edom to the Nabataeans. And see, God can do that because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's true we have a deed at the courthouse says we own a piece of ground from the corner of Pepper back to the corner of Eucalyptus and man down 654 feet covering 18 acres. So what? But God actually owns it. It's his ground. He's only lending it to us. And that little piece of real estate that you have or farm or tract that you have, God's just lending it to you. He's loaning it to you. It's his land. The earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness 
thereof. So we see here the unpardonable sin of, of Edom. Violent, destructive, two-faced, sinful, wicked individuals that didn't even care for their own brothers in the flesh. Sold them out to the enemy. Now, Obadiah is able to look down through the annals of time and he can see, as do all of the prophets in the Old Testament, he can see the eventuality when the right is going to be, correction, when the wrong is going to be righted. And he sees ultimately the day of the Lord. And so we get this, Edom in the day of the Lord. This is verses 15 through 16. And the day of the Lord is that span of time which begins after the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon concludes the 70th week of Daniel. And then when Armageddon is over, then begins the 1,000 millennial kingdom reign of Christ. Now how about Edom in the millennial kingdom? Because all of the millennial kingdom preaching that we hear today, practically all of it, is that the whole world is going to be a fantastic place. Not be any war. People will not die as they do today. Disease will be curtailed. There will not be any disease. We hear all of these things. And we hear about a highway uh, flowing up and down the coast of the Mediterranean all the way from Europe down into the country of Egypt. And we hear about the Lord Christ having a temple in Jerusalem. We hear all of that. And it says that the law and the knowledge of the word is to flow out of Jerusalem. But how about Edom? This is verses 15 through 16. Note what it says. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, or Gentiles. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. This section of scripture has never been fulfilled. It's unfulfilled. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head, for as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen, or Gentiles, drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. In other words, Edom is going to be even a desolation in the millennial kingdom. There's nothing prophesied for Edom, the Edomites. The only thing that's predominantly good about the land of Edom is that during the 70th week of Daniel, the Bible says that a remnant of the house of Israel is going to be hidden away in the mountains of Edom. You get that in the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel and God is going to take something that's bad and he's going to use it for his people and it's rather interesting but his people couldn't even get into Edom originally you remember because Moses tried to strike up a deal with the king and the king wouldn't have anything to do with it now it's rather interesting but during the 70th week of Daniel God is going to use Edom as the hiding place for the remnant of his people. We pick this up in the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel, but keep your finger there at the book of Obadiah. But in Daniel 11, it tells us that when the Antichrist flees after the remnant of Israel, that the land of Edom is going to be off limits to the Antichrist. There's this same question has come up over the years, but I'm specifically impressed with one letter, and this letter said, can't they bomb Edom in the 70th week of Daniel? Couldn't they uh, drop atomic bombs into the mountainous country of Edom? And I said, no, they can't, because God won't let them. And now notice, it's rather interesting. 
This is verse 41 of Daniel chapter 11, talking about the Antichrist. Notice carefully, he, Antichrist, he shall enter also into the glorious land. This is the land of Palestine. When he becomes, in the first three and a half years of his reign, as he begins to become rather famous, he shall enter into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. These mountainous countries are going to escape out of his hand. Which ones are they? Even Edom. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So there's going to be the using of Edom for the sheltering and the protection of the children of God during that 70th week of Daniel. And this is why we're on the subject. We might as well pursue it just a little bit further. And this is confirmed in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And we're looking here about verse 14. Verse 14. Note what it says. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, symbolic of the speed of the flight of the children of Israel in the 70th week of Daniel. The woman Israel were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And you'll notice verse 16 as the Antichrist army pursues the remnant of Israel into the land of Edom, verse 16 says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The same thing that happened way back in Numbers 16, verses 29 through 33, when Moses was uh, giving God an opportunity to display his strength. Moses said, uh, This crowd over here is against us. They claim they're of God. We say we're of God. If they are not of God, Moses said in Numbers, the reference I gave you there, he said, let the ground open up and swallow them. And that's what's going to happen in Edom when the Antichrist army pursues the Jews down into that mountain refuge stronghold, the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 16, that the earth is going to help the woman and the earth is going to swallow up the flood. The Antichrist soldiers, and they'll never be heard of again, and Edom is off limits. It's off limits to the Antichrist. They're not going to be dropping bombs in that area, none whatsoever. So we can see here that Edom in the day of the Lord is going to suffer the consequences of her sin because as I quoted in Galatians 6 verse 7, whatsoever a person sows, that's what they're going to reap. Edom sowed selfishness and pride and bitterness and all kinds of things which were contrary to the family of God. And so God is going to allow her to reap a harvest of that so she won't ever be a, a nation anymore. Number four, the extermination of Edom. This is verses 17 through 18. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. God's going to give the contrast. Extermination of Edom. But... Up on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. Never mount a hill of beans, God says. The Jews are going to prosper. But you Edomites, you'll just be a, you'll just be for a house of stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. In other words, Edom will be utterly destroyed. Because God's universal law. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. 
That's why it's, 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 it's very imperative that we be kind to one another. Loving, sympathetic, generous. Help one another when we possibly can. Because if we are the contrary or the opposite, we are sowing seeds that will bring back a harvest which we won't like, which will not be for our benefit or for our good or a blessing upon us. So we see here that the extermination of Edom is a simple, pure, positive thing prophesied by Obadiah about 2,800 years ago. Lastly, the restoration of Israel. Now, beginning way back there, and we've studied, this Obadiah book covers a period of 100 years between approximately 900 and 800 B.C. And we, we see that the land of Edom sinned against God. The people sinned against God. The people did everything they could to exterminate those in Judah. But yet God, though the Edomites are nothing today, just a remnant of what used to be when you visit the rock mountain fortress cities their land, but yet God is going to restore Israel. Notice in verses 19 through 21. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau. Now they of the south, evidently this, this must refer to Judah who possessed the south country. Eventually, the Israelites will take over, and I believe I'm safe in saying this because it's part of the promised land. I believe I'm safe in saying that the Israelites will eventually take over the country of Jordan. They took half of it in June of 67. And now the prime minister, premier of Israel, is threatening to move his office from New Jerusalem over to East Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem is the old city of Jerusalem, which dates back to the days of Abraham when he paid tithes to the, to the high priest uh, Melchizedek of Salem. And the United States and Canada and uh, Great Britain and New Zealand and those places, they're just so nervous that the, Israel is going to establish their, their capital in old Jerusalem. And when you read in the papers about East Jerusalem, that's old Jerusalem. But God is going to bless Israel in the days when she is restored. Verse 19, notice what it says, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. In the future restoration of Israel, the Israelites are going to reach out and they're going to possess all of the area around what we now call the Holy Land. The restoration of Israel, verse 20, and the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites. This is telling what Israel is going to possess in the millennial kingdom, shall possess that of the Canaanites even unto Zarephath. Zarephath is in the southern part of what we now call Lebanon, just across the border in the northern go across the northern border of Israel and then in the southern border of Lebanon where they're now having uh, the, the skirmishes where Israel is going constantly and bombarding areas where PLO terrorists are operating out of. That's the area of Zarephath. So Israel is evidently going to, in the Millennial Kingdom, going up into southern Lebanon and take that part of the country. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Shepharad, shall possess the cities of the south, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This phrase, saviors, 
Uh, this could refer to deliverers, uh, referring to the Messiah and his resurrected saints, and the angels who will make up the armies of heaven after the battle of Armageddon who will deliver Israel because in that day the Bible says that God is going to send angels out to the four corners of the earth and every Israelite all over the world is going to be taken back to that part of, of the Holy Land. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Christ will set up his kingdom over the house of Jacob and all nations forever. Little book of Obadiah. More informative Bible study lectures on tapes are available to you from our large tape library. Request the latest cassette tape catalog when you write to World Prophetic Ministry, Colton, California, 92324.